Oshin in Tirnanog, or the last of the Fena. According to an ancient legend, Finn's son Oshin, the hero poet, survived until the time of St. Patrick, some 200 years after the other Fena. On a certain occasion, when the saint asked him how he had lived to such a great age, the old hero related the following story. A short time after the fatal Battle of Gavra, where so many of our heroes fell, we were hunting on a dewy morning near the brink of Loch Lane, where the trees and the hedges around us were all fragrant with blossoms, and the little birds sang melodious music on the branches. We soon roused the deer from their thickets, and as they bounded over the plain, our hounds followed them in full cry. We were not long engaged when we saw a rider coming swiftly towards us from the west, and we soon perceived that it was a maiden on a white steed. We all ceased from the chase on seeing the lady, who reined in as she approached. And Finn and the Fena were greatly surprised, for they had never before seen so lovely a maiden. A slender golden diadem encircled her head, and she wore a brown robe of silk, spangled with the stars of red gold which was fastened by a brooch, and it fell from her shoulders till it swept the ground. Her yellow hair flowed far down over the robe in bright golden ringlets. Her blue eyes were clear as the drops of dew on the grass, and while her small white hand held the bridle and curbed her steed with a golden bit, she sat more gracefully than the swan on Loch Lane. The white steed was covered with a smooth flowing mantle. He was shod with four shoes of pure yellow gold, and all in Erin a better or more beautiful steed could not be found. As she came slowly to the presence of Finn, he addressed her courteously with these words. Who art thou, O lovely youthful princess? Tell us thy name and the name of thy country, and relate to us the cause of thy coming. She answered in a sweet and gentle voice. The noble king of the Fena, I have had a long journey this day, and for my country lies far off in the western sea. I am the daughter of the king of Tirnanog, and my name is Neve of the Golden Hair. And what is it that has caused thee to come so far across the sea? Has thy husband forsaken thee, or what evil has befallen thee? My husband has not forsaken me, for I have never been married or betrothed to any man. But I love thy noble son, Oshin, and this is what brought me to Erin. It is not without reason that I have given him my love, and that I have undertaken this long journey. For I have often heard of his bravery, his gentleness, and the nobleness of his person. Many princes and high chiefs have sought me in marriage, but I was quite indifferent to all men, and never consented to wed, till my heart was moved with love for thy gentle son, Oshin. When I heard these words, and when I looked upon the lovely maiden with her glossy golden hair, I was all over in love with her. I came near and taking her small hand in mine, I told her she was a mild star of brightness and beauty, and that I preferred her to all the princesses in the world for my wife. Then, said she, I place you under the gesa, which true heroes never break through, to come with me on my white steed to Tirnanog, the land of never-ending youth. It is the most delightful and the most renowned country under the sun. There is an abundance of gold and silver and jewels, of honey and wine, and the trees bear fruit and blossoms and green leaves all together, all year round. You will get a hundred swords and a hundred robes of silk and satin, a hundred swift steeds and a hundred slender, keen-scenting hounds. You will get herds of cows without number and flocks of sheep with fleeces of gold, a coat of mail that cannot be pierced, and a sword that has never missed a stroke, and from which no one has ever escaped alive. There are feasting and harmless pastimes each day. A hundred warriors fully armed shall always await you at a call, and harpers shall delight you with their sweet music. You will wear the diadem of a king, the king of Tirnanog, which he never yet gave to anyone under the sun, and which you will guard day and night, in a tumult of battle and danger of every kind. Lapse of time shall bring neither decay nor death, and you shall be forever young 
and gifted with unfading beauty and strength. All these delights you shall enjoy, and many others that I do not mention, and I myself will be your wife if you come with me to Tirnanog. I replied that she was my choice above all the maidens in the world, and that I would willingly go with her to the land of youth. When my father, Finn, and the Fena heard me say this, and knew that I was going from them, they raised three shouts of grief and lamentation, and Finn came up to me and took my hand in his, saying sadly, Woe is me, my son, that you are going away from me, for I do not expect that you will ever return. The manly beauty of his countenance became quite dimmed with sorrow, and though I promised to return to him after a little time and fully believed that I should see him again, I could not check my tears as I gently kissed my father's cheek. I then bade farewell to my dear companions and mounted the white steed while the lady kept her seat before me. She gave me the signal, and the steed galloped swiftly and smoothly towards the west till he reached the strand, and when his gold-shod boots touched the waves, he shook himself and neighed three times. He made no delay, but plunged forward at once, moving over the face of the sea with the speed of a cloud shadow on a March day. The wind overtook the waves and we overtook the wind, so that we straightway lost sight of land, and we saw nothing but billows tumbling before us and billows tumbling behind us. Other shores came into view, and we saw many wonderful things on our journey. Islands and cities, lime-white mansions, bright green inns, and lofty palaces. A hornless fawn once crossed our course, bounding nimbly along the crest of one wave to the crest of another, and close after in full chase a white hound with red ears. We also saw a lovely young maiden on a brown steed, with a golden apple in her hand, and as she passed swiftly by, a young warrior on a white steed plunged after her, wearing a long flowing mantle of yellow silk and holding a gold gilted sword in his hand. I knew not of these things, and marvelling much I asked the princess what they meant, but she answered, Heed not what you see here, Oshin, for all these wonders are nothing compared with what you will see in Tirnanog. At last we saw, at a great distance, rising over the waves on every verge of the sea, a palace more splendid than all the others, and, as we drew near, its front glittered like the morning sun. I asked the lady what royal house this was, and who was the prince that ruled over it. This country is the land of virtues, she replied. Its king is the giant, Fomor of the Blows, and its queen, the daughter of the king of the land of life. This Fomor brought the lady away by force from her own country, and keeps her in his palace, but she has put him under a gesa that he cannot break through, never to ask her to marry him till she can find a champion to fight him in single combat. But she still remains in bondage, for no hero has yet come hither who has the courage to meet the giant. A blessing on you, golden-haired knave, I replied. I have never heard music sweeter than your voice, and although I feel pity for this princess, yet your story is pleasant to me to hear. For of a certainty I will go to the palace and try whether I cannot kill this Fomor and free the lady. So we came to the land, and as we drew nigh to the palace, the lovely young queen met us and bade us welcome. She led us in and placed us on chairs of gold, after which choice food was placed before us and drinking horns filled with meat and golden goblets of sweet wine. When we had eaten and drunk, the mild young princess told us her story, while tears streamed from her soft blue eyes, and she ended by saying, I shall never return to my own country and to my father's house, so long as this great and cruel giant is alive. When I heard her sad words and saw her tears falling, I was moved with pity. And telling her to cease from her grief, I gave her my hand as a pledge that I would meet the giant, and either slay him or fall myself in her defence. While we were yet speaking, we saw the giant coming towards us. He was large of body and ugly and hateful in appearance, carrying a load of deer skins on his back and holding a great iron club in his hand. He threw down his load when he saw us, turned a surly look on the princess and said, without greeting us or showing the least mark of courtesy, he forthwith challenged me to battle in a loud, rough voice. 
It was not my wont to be dismayed by a call to battle, or to be terrified at the sight of an enemy, and I went forth at once without the least fear in my heart. But though I had fought many battles in Erin against the wild boars and enchanters and foreign invaders, never before did I find it so hard to preserve my life. We fought for three days and three nights without food or drink or sleep, for the giant did not give me a moment for rest, and neither did I give him. At length, when I looked at the two princesses weeping in great fear, and when I called to mind my father's deeds in battle, the fury of my valour arose, and with a sudden onset I felled the giant to the earth, and instantly, before he could recover, I cut off his head. When the maidens saw the monster lying on the ground dead, they uttered three cries of joy, and they came to me and led me to the palace. For I was indeed bruised all over and covered with gory wounds, and a sudden dizziness of the brain and feebleness of the body seized me. But the daughter of the king of the land of life applied precious balsam and healing herbs to my wounds, and in a short time I was healed, and my cheerfulness of mind returned. Then I buried the giant in a deep and wide grave, and I raised a great carn over him, and I placed on it a stone with his name graved in Ogham. We rested that night, and the dawn of the next morning, Neve said to me it was time for us to resume our journey to Tirnanog. So we took leave of the daughter of the king of the land of life, and though her heart was joyful after her release, she wept at our departure, and we were not less sorry for parting from her. When we had mounted the white steed, he galloped towards the strand, and soon as his hoofs touched the waves, he shook himself and neighed three times. We plunged forward over the clear green sea with the speed of a march wind on a hillside, and soon we saw nothing but billows tumbling before us and billows tumbling behind us. We saw again the fawn chased by the white hound with red ears, and the maiden with the golden apple passed swiftly by, followed by the young warrior in the yellow silk on his white steed, and again we passed many strange islands and cities and white palaces. The sky now darkened so that the sun was hidden from our view. A storm arose and the sea was lighted up with constant flashes. But though the wind blew from every point of the heavens and the waves rose up and roared around us, the white steed kept his horse straight on, moving as calmly and swiftly as before, through the foam and the blinding spray, without being delayed or disturbed in the least, and without turning either to the right or the left. At length the storm abated, and after a time the sun shone again brightly, and when I looked up, I saw a country near at hand, all green and full of flowers, with beautiful smooth plains, blue hills, and bright lakes and waterfalls. Not far from the shore stood a palace of surpassing beauty and splendour. It was all covered with gold and gems of every kind, blue, green, crimson, and yellow, and on each side were green and shining with precious stones, built by artists the most skilful that could be found. I asked Neve the name of that delightful country, and she replied, This is my native country, dear Nanook, and there is nothing I have promised you that you will not find in it. As soon as we reached the shore, we dismounted, and now we saw, advancing from the palace, a troop of noble-looking warriors, all clad in bright garments, who came forward to meet and welcome us. Following these, we saw a stately, glittering host, with the king at their head, wearing a robe of bright yellow satin covered in gems, and a crown that sparkled with gold and diamonds. The queen came after, attended by a hundred lovely young maidens, and they advanced towards us. It seemed to me that this king and queen exceeded all kings and queens of the world in beauty and gracefulness and majesty. After they had kissed their daughter, the king took my hand and said aloud in the hearing of the host, This is Oshin, the son of Finn, for whom my daughter Neve travelled over the sea to Erin. This is Oshin, who is to be the husband of Neve of the golden hair. We give you a hundred thousand welcomes, brave Oshin. You will forever be young in this land. All kinds of delights and innocent pleasures are awaiting you and my daughter. The gentle, golden-haired Neve shall be your wife, for I am the king of Dirnanog. I gave thanks to the king, and I bowed low to the queen, 
after which we went into the palace where we found a banquet prepared. The feasting and rejoicing lasted for ten days, and on the last day I was wedded to the gentle maid of the golden hair. I lived in the land of youth more than three hundred years, but it appeared to me that only three years had passed since the day I had parted from my friends. At the end of that time, I began to have a longing desire to see my father, Finn, and all my old companions, and I asked leave of Neve and of the king to visit Erin. The king gave me permission, and Neve said, I will give consent, though I feel sorrow in my heart, for I fear you will never return to me. I replied I would surely return, and that she did not feel any doubt or dread for that white steed knew the way and would bring me back safely. Then she addressed me in these words, which seemed very strange to me. I will not refuse this request, though your journey afflicts me with great grief and fear. Erin is not now as it was when you left. The great King Finn and his Bena are all gone, and you will find, instead of them, a holy father and hosts of priests and saints. Now think well on what I say to you, and keep my words in your mind. If once you alight from the white steed, you will never come back to me. Again, I warn you, if you place your feet on the ground, the green sod of iron, you will never return to this lovely land. A third time, O oh, Ocean, my beloved husband, a third time I say to you, if you alight from the white steed, you will never see me again. I promised that I would faithfully attend her words, and that I would not alight from the white steed. Then, as I looked into her gentle face and marked with grief, my heart was weighed down with sadness, and my tears flowed plentifully. But even so, my mind was bent on coming back to iron. When I had mounted the white steed, he galloped straight towards the shore. We moved as swiftly as before over the clear sea. The wind overtook the waves, and we overtook the wind, so that straight away we left the land of youth behind, and passed by many islands and cities, till at length we landed on the green shores of Erin. As I travelled on through the country, I looked closely around me, but I scarcely knew the old places, for everything seemed strangely altered. I saw no sign of Finn and his host, and I began to dread that Neve's saying was coming true. At length I spied at distance a company of little men and women, all mounted on horses as small as themselves, and when I came near they greeted me kindly and courteously. They looked at me with wonder and curiosity, and they marvelled much at my great size and at the beauty and majesty of my person. I asked them about Finn and the Fena, whether they were still living, or if any sudden disaster had swept them away. And one replied, We have heard of the hero Finn, who ruled the Fena of Erin in old times, and who never had an equal for bravery and wisdom. The poets of the Gales have written many books concerning his deeds and the deeds of the Fena, which we can not now relate. They are all long ago and gone. They lived many ages ago. We have also heard and have seen it written in very, very old books that Finn had a son named Oshin. Now, this Oshin went with a young fairy maiden to Tirnan Oak, and his father and friends sorrowed greatly after him and sought him long, but he was never seen again. When I heard all this, I was filled with amazement, and my heart grew heavy with great sorrow. I silently turned my steed away from the wandering people and set forward straight away for Alan of the Mighty Deeds, on the broad green plains of Leinster. It was a miserable journey to me, and though my mind, being full of sadness at all I had seen and heard, it forecasted further sorrows, I was grieved more than when I reached Alan, for there indeed I found the hill deserted and lonely, and my father's palace all in ruins and overgrown with grass and weeds. I turned slowly away, and afterwards fared through the land in every direction in search of my friends. But I met only crowds of little people, all strangers who gazed on me with wonder, and none knew me. 
I visited every place throughout the country where I knew the Fena had lived, but I found their houses all like Alan, solitary and in ruins. At length I came to Glenismore, where many a time I had hunted in the days of old with the Fena, and there I saw a crowd of people in the glen. As soon as they saw me, one of them came forward and said, Come to us, thou mighty hero, and help us out of our strait, for thou art a man of vast strength. I went to them, and found a number of men trying in vain to raise a large flat stone. It was half lifted from the ground, but those who were under it were not strong enough either to raise it further or to free themselves from its weight. And they were in great distress and on the point of being crushed to death. I thought it a shameful thing that so many men should be unable to lift the stone, which Oscar, if he were alive, would take in his right hand and fling over the heads of the feeble crowd. After I had looked on a little while, I stooped forward and seized the flag with one hand, and putting forth my strength, I flung it seven perches from its place and relieved the little men. But with great strain, the golden saddle girth broke, and bounding forward to keep myself from falling, I suddenly came the ground on my two feet. The moment the white steed felt himself free, he shook himself and made. Then starting off with the speed of a cloud shadow on a March day, he left me standing helpless and sorrowful. Instantly a woeful change came over me. The sight of my eyes began to fade. The ruddy beauty of my face fled. I lost all my strength and I fell to the earth, a poor, withered old man, blind and wrinkled and feeble. The white steed was never seen again. I never recovered my sight, my youth or my strength. And I have lived in this manner, sorrowing without ceasing for my gentle golden-haired wife, Neith, and thinking ever of my father, Finn, and of the lost companions of my youth. I very much hope that you have enjoyed the legend of Oisin in the land of Tir it's a story from my childhood and one that I've read many, many times over the years. Now and again, I will bring you more tales from the Irish legends. This episode is dedicated to my family and dear friends. Sometimes all we need to do is to stop, sit and give ourselves a moment. To lose ourselves in our imaginations and the worlds of long ago. As always, you can reach me via email, mlegendlore at gmail.com and at loremyth on Twitter. I'm Siobhan Clark. Thank you for listening to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast.